Welcome to Human Monsters. Cassie Moore was born in Dublin, Ireland in July 1966. She was conceived out of wedlock, which was a scandalous circumstance in 1960s Ireland. Her biological father abandoned her mother. Her stepfather married her mother two months before Cassie was born. Cassie's mother suffered from mental illness, primarily depression. She was cold and self-absorbed, likely characteristics that were complications of the disorder. Her mother underwent electric shock treatments and took medication as remedies for her depression, with little consequence. In fact, it appeared to lead to other complications and increased severity. She had a fearsome temper. Her stepfather was a womanizer, and it added to his mother's emotional distress. He also abused Cassie and would frequently beat her mother as well. He threw his weight around and instilled a great deal of fear in Cassie. She never loved him. She only feared him. She disliked him for as long as she could remember. It was hardly endearing when Cassie's mother recounted an incident that consisted of her stepfather losing his temper and dangling Cassie over some banisters when she was only six weeks old, whereupon he threatened to drop her. Her mother laughed as she told this story. Cassie was emotionally abused. Her parents would tell her hurtful things, like her very existence was the root of everything that went wrong in their lives. She was told that she was conceived by mistake and should never have been born. Cassie heard such statements so frequently over the years that they became normalized to some extent, but it always hurt and the pain stayed with her. Cassie's first memories are from her third year of life. She had two sisters, 11-month-old Sharon and Patricia, who was born a year later. The family lived in poverty. They didn't even have proper beds to sleep on, so they slept on the floor with old coats as blankets. They were food insecure. Their furniture was in disrepair, and they had a black and white TV as their only entertainment. At every turn, it was a grim circumstance. She didn't remember a time when her mother and stepfather weren't fighting. Her mother would end up crying, and he would shout. The children felt perpetually scared, hungry, and love-deprived. Having struggled so much financially, Cassie's mother placed her in a children's home, perhaps an orphanage. Conditions in the children's home were no better than what Cassie endured at home. When her mother went back to collect Cassie, she congratulated herself for bringing her back after noting how neglected Cassie was in the children's home. In fact, she didn't recognize Cassie until she called out to her. Cassie's face was covered in cold sores. She also contracted rickets, jaundice, and hepatitis. Her health was in such a wretched state she was taken directly to hospital. It was her last period of respite before being brought back to her family's house, where the screaming and beatings resumed in full force. Her parents would go out for the evening, and unlike other parents who arranged for a babysitter to mind their children, they simply left Cassie and her siblings home alone. Cassie would get up and wander the house alone, crying for her mother. When her mother came home, she would strike Cassie as hard as she could for getting out of bed. She dragged her by her arm to the coat on the floor and left her there without so much as saying good night. Cassie struggled in school. One area that was difficult was reading aloud. She developed a stammer one day after her mother hit her in the head. Cassie would feel so humiliated while stammering her way through reading in front of the class that the teacher's amusement led to her wetting herself. Her teacher would even encourage the class to mimic her. At a very early age, Cassie learned to dissociate from painful events as a coping mechanism. This became routine at school. Young Cassie loved music and enjoyed singing. One song she sang was called Nobody's Child. Her mother told her it was written especially for Cassie. 
Cassie cannot remember a time from her childhood when she was not abused in some way. However, it escalated one day in a way that even her mother would have considered to be unprecedented. One day her mother went out to do some shopping and took Sharon with her. Patricia was still a baby and was left in her crib. Otherwise, Cassie and her stepfather were left alone in the house. He was sitting on their sofa watching television. Normally, when he spoke to Cassie, it was just to scream or bark orders. His demeanor was markedly different on this occasion. He was softly spoken. He even smiled. Normally, he only smiled at his mistresses. He told Cassie to go and sit with him on the sofa. Having done so, he took Cassie's hand and placed it on his crotch. He said, Daddy wants you to play. Too young to realize how inappropriate this was, she was happy to play. After all, she was only used to receiving negative attention from him. She was pleased to participate. He pulled his penis out of his pants and told her it was a lily. He instructed her to rub it and even demonstrated the technique to her. Unaware of the moral implications, she did as she was asked. This came to a halt when the door opened and her mother walked in. Cassie's stepfather pushed her away and zipped up his pants. Cassie, still believing that it was all a harmless game, went to her mother and told her that he let her play with his lily. Cassie felt a vicious slap on her face. It was delivered with enough force it sent her staggering. He screamed at her to shut up and leave her mother alone. He dragged her to her room and screamed at her to remain there until she was told she could leave. With no consolation and nothing in which to escape, she was left with nothing to do but sit on the floor and cry. She was terrified and baffled by his reaction. How could he have been so taken with the activity earlier and then used her reportage as a reason for punishment minutes later? Despite his confusing and abusive behavior, they played this game several times whenever they were alone together. Cassie's life got even worse when they moved into the house of her stepfather's mother. She despised Cassie and her mother. She openly referred to Cassie as a bastard child, within hearing distance of Cassie. She would run her mother down until she made her cry. The only time Cassie can recall her mother expressing love and concern for her was when she was hit by a car. It took something as extreme as that to defrost her heart. Another time when she got her mother's approval was when she performed some Irish dancing routines in a recital. It was about that time when her mother simply disappeared. The girls were not told where she was, why she went there, or how long she would stay. Her stepfather told her and her sisters that they were going on vacation. A woman they knew as Mrs. Kelly picked them up in a car and drove them away. She would learn later that Mrs. Kelly was a social worker. She took them to a children's home. It almost had the atmosphere of a haunted house, with its cold, dark atmosphere. Cassie was terrified, and her sisters were crying. They were introduced to nuns. The nuns brought them into a room featuring four bathtubs. They told them to undress. Patricia became hysterical now, crying even harder. One of the nuns grabbed her arm and glared at her. She told her if she didn't stop crying, she would give her something to cry for. All three girls stopped crying. The girls' clothing was confiscated, and they were given clothes provided by the house. The dress given to Cassie was dirty, with a dollop of blackberry jam on the front. Cassie began to cry again. The nun who screamed at her sister grabbed Cassie and screamed at her to shut up, or she would regret her lack of compliance. From there, they were taken to a rec room, where another nun led them and other children in play. They were forced to pray every night, and if they didn't say their Hail Marys in accordance with Catholic protocols, they would be struck and put to bed immediately. 
Cassie and her sisters would cry at night while trying not to let it be heard. Cassie would bring her sisters into her bed with her to console them. The nuns didn't approve, but they did little to stop it. Survival in the orphanage meant doing anything to avoid displeasing the nuns, which would result in insults and beatings. One day Cassie's stepfather and Mrs. Kelly showed up out of the blue. Cassie and her sisters were withdrawn from the orphanage. When they arrived home, their mother was in the house. Her stepfather had told them they had a new sister, whose name was Catherine. At first it was a pleasant home environment in her stepfather's mother's house, but eventually the dysfunction creeped back in. With the house occupied by so many people, her stepfather would take her out to some isolated fields to play the game. Cassie wasn't disturbed by it at the time. She didn't have any kind of feelings about it one way or another. She just saw it as a chore she was required to do. She would dissociate while she did it and pretend as though it wasn't happening. Her stepfather fought with Cassie's mother, and his mother would join in. It was just like old times, except it was exacerbated by the element of a crying baby. At one point, her mother couldn't take it anymore, and she brought all four girls to a social housing development, where they started a new life. Their new home was located near a popular hotel, and her mother forced Cassie to beg American and German tourists for money. She warned her that if she didn't come home with any money, she would be beaten. Even in freezing, inclement weather, Cassie would stand outside with her fingers turning numb in hopes of receiving alms from tourists. The impact on her psyche was worsened by the comparable privilege the hotel guests enjoyed. If she received no money at all, or a paltry few pennies, her mother would slap her and tell her she was useless. Her stepfather moved into the unit with them, and for a time they were happy, or at least happy in comparison to their time in his mother's house. Even sleep was hard. They were cut by mattress springs, scratched by the material of their blankets, and bitten by bed bugs. Cassie and her family began attending regular services at a Pentecostal church after her mother and stepfather befriended a couple who stimulated their interest in the sect. At church, her mother and stepfather were social butterflies, all smiles and appearing as though they hadn't a care in the world. At home, the fighting continued, and the children were still beaten for even the most trivial of transgressions. And Cassie's stepfather continued to rope Cassie into his game. The abuse to which Cassie had been subjected for years got worse. Sometimes at night, Cassie would hear her stepfather's footsteps outside the bedroom door. She shared the room with her sisters so he couldn't play the game in there. He would say in a near whisper, Cassie, can you get up and make Daddy a cup of coffee? This was his cue. She knew what time it was. By the time she would present the coffee to him, he would be masturbating openly. Every time he would say, Look what Daddy has for you. He would have her perform sex acts on him, up to and including oral sex. She would walk away with a sore throat. It made her wretch. It felt like she might vomit. Once it was finished, the sweet talking came to an end. He reverted back to his no-nonsense tone and told her to return to bed. She would cry herself to sleep. It got to the point where it happened two or three times every week. Her mother was so involved with the church that Cassie was left home alone with her stepfather more than ever. Sadly, it got even worse. One night she complied when he ordered her to perform a sexual favor on him. This time she wasn't dispatched back to her room. He told her to sit on the sofa and spread her legs. He began to touch her vagina. She hated it. She asked him to stop. He refused and became angry. He told her to shut up. He put his hand on her mouth. She was terrified by the fury in his eyes. He got on top of her. 
he reeked of diesel fuel and body odor. She was nauseated by the stench. He penetrated her. She was shocked and hurt and distressed, with tears streaming down her face. She wanted to scream at him to stop. There was no sign that he would stop any time soon. It was so painful, she felt like he was going to split her in two. At one point, she thought she was at death's door. When he finally finished, he barked at her to go to bed. Her eight-year-old body was screaming with pain from head to toe. As she left the room, she looked back at him. He was smoking a cigarette. He didn't look back at her. Cassie cried herself to sleep that night. Eventually. The next day, Cassie was still very sore. She discovered large handprint-shaped bruises on her legs. She badly wanted to tell her mother what he had done. She assumed she not only wouldn't be believed, but that she would be blamed and punished. Cassie coped by pretending it wasn't happening. That was only good until the next time it would happen, and it happened frequently. In fact, it happened until she was 16 years old. She perfected the art of dissociation. She would also seek solace in writing fiction. The realm of imagination was the only place where she felt safe, though that was also a fleeting feeling, especially when her mother would see her daydreaming and beat her, calling her a, quote, deficient little bitch. Eventually, the family moved. Cassie went to a new school. She was also issued her own bedroom, though this position in the household was not as privileged as previously thought. It was separate from the other rooms and perfectly situated for her stepfather to sexually abuse her with added discretion. He took advantage of the situation, offending frequently. Her family was still heavily involved in religion, and it was hard to take when she saw her stepfather praise God amid what he was doing to Cassie. Sometimes he would do both in the same day. Cassie would often say a prayer that went something like, Please help me. Please don't let Daddy come into my room. The prayers were never answered. She hoped her life would improve after being baptized, but there was no improvement. Spring 1976. Escalation. Cassie's mother went on vacation to Canada to visit her sister for three weeks. Cassie was burdened with all the housework and child care in her absence. With her mother away, her stepfather would abuse her with impunity for hours on a daily basis. One day she discovered a hidden cache of high-quality foods that only her mother and stepfather were allowed to eat. When she asked him about them, he screamed at her and beat her for her inquiry. Another time he beat her for not wringing laundry out upstairs, leaving water to drip through a crack in the kitchen ceiling. He even threw his dinner plate at her. He would continue to beat her savagely for any perceived failure or transgression. The sexual abuse abated somewhat due to the fact that he was having an affair with a woman who lived next door. When her mother returned, they had a pleasant family reunion at the airport. Her mother was happy to see her for the third or fourth time in her life. Cassie badly wanted to tell her what her stepfather had been putting her through, but as always, she considered the consequences and kept it to herself. Eventually, her mother found out about her stepfather's affair, which led to regular heated arguments. One night, Cassie heard her mother shout at him, Don't tell her! Don't tell her! Her stepfather went into Cassie's room and said, Cass, I am not your real dad. Despite all the abuse, she was devastated to hear this and cried. It impacted her self-esteem. They had told her she shouldn't have been born, and she even felt guilty about being alive. 
still anger emerged from deep within her. He would continue to beat her. He would whip her with his belt on her bare buttocks, even after she began to develop an adolescence, with her mother sitting nearby. She never reacted. Her mother nearly had a breakdown and attempted suicide by taking a large number of pills. Some church friends helped to sort her out. She was reacting to her husband's ongoing affair with his mistress, the neighbor woman. Cassie's mother was as abusive as always. If she inspected Cassie's housework and was dissatisfied, she would beat her mercilessly. Her rage could be triggered by something as trivial as a speck of dust. She would punch her until she knocked her down to the floor. She would hit her with a hairbrush until the handle broke. She would scream at her, calling her a, quote, lazy bitch and useless, and remind her that she was a mistake. She would slap her repeatedly, telling her all the while that she hated her. Her mother used her as a domestic servant. Occasionally, she would keep her home from school so she could do housework for hours on end. If there was one molecule of filth to be identified, she would beat Cassie. One day when Cassie returned from school, she found a note written by her mother. It said she was going away for a rest because she couldn't cope. Cassie's heart sank. She knew that for as long as she was away, her stepfather would have free reign to rape her. He did as predicted. When her mother returned, Cassie didn't react in any way. She had suffered so much abuse of every kind, she had become numb to any stimuli. It was likely a shield and a coping mechanism. Soon after, the family moved. Her mother couldn't cope with her husband's affair anymore, so they moved to a new house in 1977. In her new high school, the students were not made to wear uniforms, so she wore the same outfit every day, which led to bullying. Her peers called her smelly. With the changes of puberty came more troubles for Cassie. She gained weight. She developed severe acne. She would arrange her hair to conceal the acne, but her mother insisted that she pull it away from her face. Her mother would make fun of her. Cassie became socially withdrawn, awkward, and prone to self-loathing. She also became embittered. She hated everyone, including herself. Her stepfather was still raping her, though she became more insistent about her distaste for it. In retaliation, he would threaten to abuse one of her sisters. She couldn't bear the thought of her sisters experiencing the abuse, especially with her at fault for it, so she let him carry on with it. Cassie struggled at school due to an inability to concentrate on her work. The stress at home was destroying her from the outside in. At the age of 13, Cassie's mother told her she had to get a job. Her mother took all her week's wages except for bus fare to school. Her mother heaped praises on her sister Sharon, her favorite. She considered Cassie to be troublesome, though Cassie never went out of her way to upset her mother. One Christmas, Cassie received a used guitar as a gift. She loved to sing, and now she had an instrument for accompaniment. She began to write her own songs. One song was called, Do You Feel Lonely? The lyrics went as follows. Do you feel lonely and nobody cares? Do you need someone but there's nobody there? Just turn to Jesus. He loves you. Just turn to Jesus. He'll always be true. Do you feel like shouting but no one can hear? Do you feel like crying but can't shed a tear? Just turn to Jesus. He loves you. Just turn to Jesus. He will always be true. Sometimes after she was beaten and or humiliated by her mother or raped by her stepfather, she would play that song to cope in the aftermath. One day Cassie had a heavier period than usual. Not only was there a heavier quantity of blood, but she experienced intense cramps. The pain was so overwhelming, she asked her boss to excuse her from work. 
When she got home, she explained what happened to her mother. Her mother shouted at her for getting blood on the back of her skirt. She followed Cassie into the bathroom, still shouting at her. Cassie wondered if she were at death's door. Once she cleaned up and left the bathroom, she went to the living room and approached her mother. Hateful as always, her mother shouted that Cassie had better have cleaned up the mess entirely. She said that if her husband caught a glimpse of it, he would kill Cassie. She warned Cassie not to tell anybody about what happened. Cassie realized years later that she had had a miscarriage. Her stepfather's child died, an act of mercy, no doubt. The family moved yet again. Cassie was working full-time, so her stepfather didn't abuse her as much as before, though an incident would crop up from time to time. She had a boyfriend named Jim. Jim was her savior. He got her job working in a domestic capacity for a woman he knew, and she moved out of her family's house. No more beatings from her mother. No more sexual abuse from her stepfather. She lived with Jim's family, and she was warmly received by them. She loved living with them out in the country. They had no idea it was like they had rescued her from a POW camp. She would visit her mother's house on Sundays. Her sisters had become cold and distant toward her, which was deeply disappointing. But she was so happy about how everything else was going that she decided she could take the good with the bad. January 1983. Cassie was happier than she had ever been. Her mother would call her every day on the phone, but aside from her grousing about things that were happening at home, there was little else about their lives that could affect Cassie. February 1983. One day Cassie went to visit her family's house. She was told to go upstairs and visit with her sisters. Her mother, stepfather, and Jim all wanted to talk. Cassie did as she was told. Her sisters resented her. They told her they hated her and cursed her out. She asked them why they were being so spiteful. They said, You don't care about us anymore. Now you have moved out, you think you are something special. They told her they were forced to do all the chores Cassie had to do while she was still living there. Her mother told them they were useless and that their performance was subpar compared to that of Cassie's. This was distressing to Cassie. Her mother turned her sisters against her. Before Cassie could explain things from her point of view, her mother called her downstairs. When Cassie found her mother in the kitchen, her mother was waving a document in her direction. She was smiling for the second or third time in the last decade. In fact, she was quite elated. Cassie was dumbfounded. Jim and her stepfather were standing nearby. They were also smiling from ear to ear. Her mother was excited and couldn't contain it anymore. She informed Cassie that she was getting married. The document was a marriage consent form, which they were required to sign since Cassie was only 16 years old at the time. Cassie was at a loss for words. She felt herself grow icy from shock. Jim had spoken of marrying her in jest, but she always assumed it was nothing but that, a joke. Her mother handed Jim the completed document and told Cassie to peel potatoes for dinner. Her mother, stepfather, and Jim went to the living room to discuss Cassie's future. Cassie wasn't ready to get married. She wanted to enjoy the pleasures of youth and find herself for a while before settling down. On the way back home, Jim talked about the wedding plans and wanted the ceremony to proceed in spring of that year. It was at that moment that Cassie suddenly realized she really didn't love him, or at least not enough to spend the rest of her life with him. Nobody ever asked Cassie how she wanted things or what she wanted out of life at all. They wound up getting married in a government office because the minister of Jim's church refused to marry them while Cassie was only 16 years old. Cassie spent a couple of weeks in her mother's house, during which time she got a hold of a wedding dress, a loner from a friend of the family. Her mother's behavior toward Cassie was vintage. It was as if Cassie had never left the house. 
She would make mean-spirited remarks about her weight or her acne. She told Cassie she was a disappointment and how she resented making sacrifices for her. One comment was cryptic to Cassie at the time. The money we got will never be enough for what you put me through. There were updates in the house's decor and some new modern appliances, so evidence of extra income abounded. Cassie didn't find out until the wedding day what the source of the money was. During that time, her stepfather made sure to squeeze in one last rape. She was at least relieved at the time that it would never happen again. That was not what he was hoping for. He made her promise him that she would let him continue to do it after she got married. She promised, but it was more out of the fear of the consequences of not making that vow. At that point, she had at least one good reason to get married. Cassie was the only unhappy attendee on the day of her wedding. Everybody else was deliriously happy. They got what they wanted. Her mother revealed that the mysterious money was a sum given to her and her husband by Jim so he could marry Cassie. Cassie was sold to him as if she were livestock. Cassie said to her mother, So you sold me? Her mother stonewalled her. She grabbed her by the arm, told her to stop whining, stop being a drama queen, and go downstairs for the minister's blessing. Cassie would ask Jim later if he bought her. He would say something to the effect of, I took you out of the slums of Dublin and gave you all this. What more do you want? Her marriage was not fulfilling. Jim spent most of his free time at the pub. She was mostly left alone with his parents, and the generation gap negated any possibility that they could connect. She adopted a dog who became her only friend. Jim didn't want her to be friends with her female contemporaries for fear that they would influence her. At one point, Cassie decided to finish her schooling. Jim was enraged. He started shouting at her, telling her she was making a fool out of him. He said there was no way any wife of his was going back to school with the result of him being a laughing stock. She wound up continuing with her life as it was, and Jim was happy. He got what he wanted. Cassie filled her spare time playing music with 11 other women. They formed a women's folk group. When Cassie was 19, she found out she was pregnant. It was a difficult pregnancy with a great deal of sickness. Her mother was still being a pain in the ass. She was always calling, wanting something from her. While Cassie was well into the third trimester, her mother sent her sister Patricia to stay with her. The purpose of this wasn't to help Cassie while she struggled with her pregnancy. It was to take care of Patricia and wait on her. Patricia had had a breakdown, and her mother hated being a mother, so she redirected Patricia's care to the child she always used as a slave. Patricia was constantly crying. Cassie didn't find out until a few years later why. One night during Patricia's visit, Cassie decided to retire early for the night as she was feeling sick from pregnancy-related complications. Jim retired to bed around that time, but she woke in the middle of the night and was surprised to find that he was gone. When she went to look for him, she was horrified when she stopped by Patricia's room and saw that Jim was trying to rape her. Patricia was only 17. Cassie went into shock. When Jim realized he was caught, he jumped out and ran out of the room. Cassie was devastated. She asked him what he thought he was doing. He blamed her for it, saying that it was because he didn't find her attractive while she was pregnant. He told her she didn't understand him. Cassie was so shocked and revolted by what she had witnessed, she felt nauseous. Cassie was used to internalizing the blame that others deflected onto her for their actions, so she came to believe that it was her fault for being pregnant with his child. He begged her not to tell his parents, and she agreed, an action she would later regret. 
The day after Jim tried to rape Patricia was his and Cassie's wedding anniversary. He was suddenly in a sentimental and romantic mood, but Cassie only felt hatred for him. She tried to talk to Patricia about what he had done, but she didn't want to deal with it. She claimed she didn't remember due to being heavily medicated. Cassie went back to internalizing everything and finding ways to cope. She hoped the birth of the child would bring some new happiness into her life. May 1986, Cassie's daughter Stephanie was born. When she brought her home, her dog, Rusty, was curious and sniffed the baby. Jim grabbed Rusty and punched him in the face, sending Rusty whimpering into the farmyard. Cassie's blood boiled. That night when Jim went to bed, Cassie asked him if he had fed Rusty. He laughed and said he had gotten rid of Rusty. She asked him what he meant. He said Rusty was jealous of Stephanie and would likely cause harm to her, so he had him put down. Though Cassie had fallen in love with her baby, Stephanie had colic for months, and her constant crying put a strain on her marriage. Once Stephanie recovered, Cassie wrote a song for her that went, A gift so wonderful and free, a gift that Jesus gave to me. A child to bear, to love, and rear. Jesus answered my prayer. He looked down with loving eyes. He blessed me with a beautiful child. Jesus answered my prayer. The marriage deteriorated further. Cassie and Jim seldom spoke, and he spent more and more of his time at the pub. He demonstrated no real love for either his wife or his daughter. Cassie and Stephanie made friends with other mothers and daughters, bringing some personal enrichment into their lives. After a year after Stephanie was born, Cassie received some shocking news. One day her mother and stepfather arrived with her younger half-sister, Sheila. Her mother was beside herself with grief and shock. She told Cassie that her stepfather had just been interviewed by police about... Allegations of sexual abuse. It was Cassie's sister Catherine who reported him. Cassie badly wanted to shout in her mother's face that Catherine's credibility was solid. She knew it wouldn't change anything. Her stepfather told her mother to go for a walk. He was pickled in self-pity as he played the role of victim. He grabbed Cassie by the throat and pushed her up against the wall. He told her that if she told anybody about what he had done to her, he would kill Stephanie, Cassie's mother, and Sheila before killing himself. A master of blackmail, he said, Now, would you want all that on your shoulders? Would you want to be the one to blame for all this? He let her go. She felt weak. It was as if she were the same little girl he abused while she was still living under his roof. He told her he also warned Sharon and Patricia that he would also kill them if they brought him to justice. Cassie was devastated by the news that he had raped all her sisters. When her mother returned, she said, What do you think of that bitch Catherine saying all that about your poor dad? Cassie wanted to scream in her mother's face what she was thinking. Oh my God, please don't tell me you believe him. Please do not stand there and pretend you did not know what was going on. Her mother was only shedding tears for herself and her husband. In the meantime, Catherine was a ward of the state. Cassie's mother said it was because she was difficult, but Cassie knew better. Catherine was generally a compliant and agreeable child. Her mother called Catherine nasty and spawn of Satan. Cassie was stunned by her parents' conduct. It was consistent with their behavioral history, but it was no less unpleasant to see them so selfish, callous, and cruel. Jim entered the room carrying Stephanie. Cassie's stepfather jumped up and requested to hold her. Jim obliged. Her stepfather brushed his beard against her skin and kissed her cheek. He looked over at Cassie with a malevolent smile. Would Stephanie one day become another link in the chain of girls to be abused by him? 
Cassie was so sickened by this display, her legs turned to jelly. Stephanie began to cry, and she swiftly pried her out of his arms. He said, Even my own granddaughter doesn't like me. Still feeling that only she and her husband deserved compassion, her mother said, Christy, don't say that. We all love you, don't we, Cassie? Cassie said nothing. Her mother continued to run Catherine down. She said they all had to go to Dublin to be interviewed by social services. They wanted to see Sheila apart from the others, so they could play some games with her to find out if she had been abused. On the day of their meeting with social services, Cassie and her sisters had a moment alone outdoors. They were all uncomfortable about the whole thing. They didn't know what to say. Patricia wasn't sure she could go through with it. She said they would have to lie, or at least Christy would murder them all. Cassie was still terrified that he would make good on his threat to kill Stephanie if she reported him. They all decided to lie and say the allegations were groundless. They would go on to regret it. The decision drove a wedge between them all. They would never be close again. They felt they had betrayed themselves and one another. They lied and said he was innocent as he glared at them. They felt ashamed. Her mother and stepfather, of course, hugged and cried tears of joy. They felt vindicated by the lie. Jim dished out generous portions of emotional abuse, like when he reminded Cassie of how fortunate she was to have been rescued from the slums by him. He kept asking her questions about the abuse she suffered. He appeared to be amused by what he gleaned from what she told him. She didn't like him at all by then. There was no friendship in their marriage whatsoever. During the weeks leading into Christmas 1987, Cassie's stepfather continued to abuse his daughters. The police were still investigating the matter. One investigator was convinced he was lying. Meanwhile, Cassie and Jim's marriage continued to rot. They argued all the time. Her mother continued to call her regularly to report what was going on with the investigation. Jim went to Canada that Christmas. Cassie didn't miss him, and it was then that she realized that she had no love for him. She felt trapped in the situation. It was about that time that she attended a Christmas party and met a man named Damien. There was a powerful attraction between them, and though she told him she was married with child, they exchanged numbers nonetheless. She had never felt such a powerful attraction before, and she very much wanted to see him again. He visited her at the house the next day. They fell in love in short order, and a full-fledged relationship soon developed. They discussed spending the rest of their lives together. Cassie fell in love with London during a visit, she loved the idea of moving there. She could get away from her mother, stepfather, and Jim permanently. The prospect was hard to resist. She fell head over heels in love with Damien. She could barely stomach the presence of Jim. Three weeks after she fell for Damien, Jim had returned and she sat him down. She told him she didn't love him anymore. She said she was leaving and would relocate to London. He was shocked and hurt. He begged her to stay. He resisted her decision to take Stephanie with her, but Cassie dug her heels in. Stephanie was going to London with her. Jim told her that the responsible thing to do would have been to get settled in London first, and then he would let Stephanie move there to be with her. The next day, when she was due to leave for London, Cassie went to fetch Stephanie, but she was not in her room. Jim had locked a partition door that blocked access to Stephanie. Cassie begged him to give her Stephanie. He said, no way. She began to cry and beg him hysterically. He just laughed at her. He said she was not going to see Stephanie again that day. He said she could have her after she was settled in London, as per his agreement, which is to say... Not the arrangement she agreed to at all. Jim's mother walked by with Stephanie in her arms. Cassie went up to her to get Stephanie, but Jim pushed her back. He grabbed the door and locked it again. Stephanie began to cry. 
Cassie stayed by the door and cried and begged. They wouldn't even acknowledge her. She called Damien and told him what happened. He told her not to worry, that once they got settled in London, Jim would make good on his promise. She confronted Jim again after he emerged from the partition, but he locked the door. He told her to calm down and said there was something he wanted to give to her. It was a check for £10,000. He said it was a final settlement of any claim she could make on his property. She had no intention of taking the farm from him. She didn't even know that as his spouse, she might be entitled to half his assets. All she wanted was her child. She told him with the money, she could immediately get settled in London. He told her that a deal was a deal, and she could only bring Stephanie over there with her once she got settled. She asked to see Stephanie one last time. His mother brought her out, but they would not let Cassie hold her. They would only let her say goodbye from afar. Meanwhile, Stephanie kept crying out, Mama! Mama! It was heartbreaking for Stephanie to see this. Before taking her to the airport, Jim drove her to his lawyer to sign documents, stating that she would not try to take his farm away from him. She signed the documents without reading them. At the airport, she said goodbye and gave Jim a very businesslike handshake. She said, See you around. As she walked toward the terminal, he called her a stupid bitch. He laughed and told her he wouldn't see her around and that she should make sure to have a look at the documents she signed. She said, I know what I signed. I didn't want any of your stupid farm anyway. In the airport, Cassie joined Damien at a bar. She told him it was because of Jim that she was running late. She showed him the documents she signed. He leafed through them until he stopped at one particular clause. It turned out that one thing Jim neglected to mention was that he had her sign over full custody and control over Stephanie. Damien assured her that there were lawyers in London who could help her get her daughter back. Cassie was unable to enjoy her new life in London without Stephanie. One night, Damien's brother's girlfriend took Cassie out for a few drinks. At one point, she warned Cassie that Damien had a history of beating his women. They were happy during their first few weeks in London, Stephanie's absence notwithstanding. At one point, Cassie asked Damien about what she had heard regarding his history of abusing women. He denied ever having struck a woman in his life. Eventually, Damien became possessive, suspicious, and jealous. Cassie got a job at a bakery, and she would sometimes engage in friendly banter with male customers. Damien insisted upon walking her home every day, and when he saw this, he became enraged. One day when she insisted to him that she was only being friendly with a couple of construction workers who came into the shop, he slapped her so hard she flew across the bed. He told her she was making a fool out of him. He left the apartment, slamming the door behind him. He returned with flowers later and apologized, saying he was upset by the very thought of anybody having her but him. While Cassie was in the process of starting legal proceedings with a lawyer to get Stephanie back, she called Jim several times so that she could hear her daughter's voice. He eventually relented. She negotiated some conditions so that she could see her again. She went back to Ireland to visit her. When the door of Jim's house opened, Stephanie stood there, a toddler now, and said to Cassie, You're my mammy. They spent a couple of days together, and it was bliss for Cassie. The third day, Jim answered the door and told Cassie she would not see Stephanie anymore unless she went through the courts, and then closed the door in her face. Cassie's last glance at Stephanie consisted of seeing her in a window before Jim pulled her away. In the meantime, things went from bad to worse for Cassie's mother, stepfather, and her sisters. The investigation was still ongoing, and it became common knowledge in their neighborhood. One day, Cassie called her mother, and her mother told her about the situation. 
She was angry at Cassie for not telling her when she moved to London, but then begged her to help them move there to get away from the crisis at home. For a time, Cassie proceeded as if they were anything but a grotesquely dysfunctional family. Still, she made sure never to be alone with her stepfather. She was dying to know how her mother could still pledge her love to a man who had sexually abused all her children. At one point, she couldn't keep it to herself anymore. Damien continued to cause stress for Cassie with his suspicious behavior. She was hired by a male-dominated law firm as a clerical worker. Speaking with men in this context was unavoidable if she wanted to keep her job. Damien could see her through a window, and he would always interrogate her afterwards. Her co-workers eventually got wise to the situation, and they were not shy about voicing their criticisms of him to Cassie. Damien was unemployed, though they planned to use the £10,000 Jim gave Cassie to purchase a limousine so that Damien could resume his career as a chauffeur. Meanwhile, Cassie got a divorce from Jim, though the custody battle would continue for years. Spring 1989. Cassie found out she was pregnant. She was thrilled. Damien was too, especially when he found out she was to have a boy. They made plans to marry. One night during a dinner party, when they had some of Damien's friends over, Cassie discovered to her horror that Damien was hooked on cocaine. He whipped it out and did it on the table with his friends. They also smoked marijuana. She had no experience with drugs, so it was difficult for her to process. Their son Josh was born in November of that year. Damien became progressively more unpleasant from the sixth month of Josh's life onwards. He was spending more and more time at the pub, leaving Cassie penniless and taking the car keys with him so she couldn't leave the house. When he returned, he would be exceedingly drunk to the point where he was staggering and slurring his words. He would bully her and take photos of her crying. Still, she believed she could not live without him. One night, shortly after she put Josh to bed, Damien had just returned from a night of drinking and attacked Cassie, beating her savagely until she bled. Josh was old enough by that point to walk, and he witnessed the assault. He was greatly distressed by it. He pointed at her face and said, Mama sore, Mama sore. The master manipulator, Damien, was sitting in the living room later with his head in his hands. He got up when she entered the room and begged for her forgiveness. He vowed that he would never strike her again. His behavior did improve in the coming weeks. He didn't spend as much time in the pub. In the meantime, her mother would try to pay a visit. Cassie would make excuses to prevent her visits. If her mother saw that Cassie had bruises on her face, she would assume Cassie had done something to earn them and would tell her so. There was no reason to believe that her mother would feel compassion for her by that point. One day, Damien followed Cassie as she went shopping with Josh. When he saw her talking to a man about Josh, he confronted her that night. He beat her black, blue, and bloody. He punched her in the face so hard, he split her lip. Blood flew everywhere. This time a neighbor happened to witness it. Cassie ran from the house. Her neighbor caught up with her and invited her into his house. Once they were inside the neighbor's house, he informed her he had seen everything and called the police. She was worried the police wouldn't believe her. After all, she was used to being disbelieved and blamed for all the abuse people heaped on her. She was also concerned about her son's fate. After being questioned by a police officer, Cassie was notified she could return to her apartment. Damien had been arrested and taken downtown. After a moment of indecision, she had decided to press charges. The next morning she called her mother in hopes that maybe she had matured and wouldn't see herself as above extending some sympathy Cassie's way. No such luck. She told Cassie that she probably deserved it and that she should not provoke Damien. Sadly, Cassie believed that it could very well have been her fault. 
Though Damien was banned from their apartment, he would show up and beg her to let him in. Eventually, she agreed to take him back on condition that he never abuse her and give up the drugs. Nevertheless, he still drank heavily and snorted cocaine. He verbally abused her, but there was no physical abuse, so she decided it was a situation she could tolerate. Unfortunately, some of Damien's behavior rubbed off on Joshua. One evening when Cassie gave Josh a carton of juice, he took the straw and put it up his nose. She immediately confiscated the straw and cried. She told Damien what happened and forbid him from bringing cocaine into the house. He no longer brought it home, but he did still do it at other locations. When Cassie went to court over Stephanie, it was decided that because Stephanie was settled and going to school in Ireland, she should stay there, rather than be unsettled by relocating to England. Cassie was granted six visitations a year. She had to pay for the flight and accommodations, which put a financial strain on her and Damien. He would use it as a bargaining chip in their arguments. At one point, Jim defied the court order and refused to allow Cassie access to Stephanie, giving her an excuse like it would have been too jarring for her to travel back and forth between Ireland and England. With that, he hung up the phone. She would call back repeatedly, but he would just pick up the handset and put it back in the cradle. Cassie wrote the following poem for Stephanie. My Little Star Little darling, my bright star, I am here, I'm not far. Close your eyes and see my smile. I am sending you love all the while. The sea is between us, but it's just a pond. No one can break our special bond. So sleep well, my darling, and know in your heart I am beside you, although we're apart. October 1994, Cassie discovered she was pregnant again. Damien wasn't nearly as thrilled as she was. Their marriage was coming apart. He was having sex with other women and tried to justify it by saying that there was nothing to it but sex. She even found another woman's underwear on their floor. He told her that if she was any good, he wouldn't resort to sleeping with other women. Yet another factor that knocked her feeling of self-worth down a few pegs. He did not support her in any way during the pregnancy. He only upset her, leading to more fights. When she went to the hospital to give birth, he dropped her off and drove away, leaving her there alone. A baby boy named Aaron was born. Aaron cried a lot and it annoyed Damien. He would throw a tantrum and leave the apartment. One night, Cassie went out with a female friend for drinks at a bar. She enjoyed the occasion, the opportunity for which being rare by this point. They went to a public park on the way home, which led to Cassie's shoes becoming muddy. When she returned home, Damien saw the mud on her shoes and accused her of seeing a man. She denied it, but he smacked her around and called her names. He took her into their bedroom and raped her, telling her that he was giving her what she got from the man in the park. She called the police and pressed charges. Like an idiot, he represented himself in court, which no one in the legal profession would ever recommend. Even if you're a lawyer, it is ill-advised to defend yourself. He told the judge that she was assaulted by the fictional man in the park, but the judge was too intuitive and experienced to fall for it, and though there was not enough evidence to substantiate a charge of rape, the judge pressed charges because of Damien's history of abusing Cassie. After the hearing, Damien went to the bank and diverted all funds away from Cassie so that she could not access money to feed their children. She was forced to go on social assistance. She was happy that she wasn't hearing from her mother. She had no money and two children to look after, so there was nothing for which her mother could use her. She came home one night and found that a window had been broken, and the mail had been stolen. 
burglars don't usually steal mail, so she concluded that it had to be Damien's doing. She couldn't prove it, but there was no one else who could have done such an irrational thing. She suspected he was following her, and she was right. He would call her and tell her what she was wearing and who she had spoken to. Eventually he would beg her to take him back and tell her it wasn't fair for the boys to grow up without their father and without money. She still loved him deep down and wanted a family unit for their children, so she accepted him back into their lives. One day her mother, stepfather, and Sheila showed up at her home unannounced. Her mother told her that Patricia called them and confronted her father about the sexual abuse. She wouldn't let up until he confessed to what he had done. Cassie turned to her stepfather and said, And what did you say? To her astonishment, he hung his head and cried. He said, I admitted it. I admitted I abused you all, but you the most. Cassie knew he wasn't crying out of remorse. It was fueled by self-pity. Her mother looked at her and said, Look at the state of your poor father. Tell me it's not true, Cass. Tell me it's all lies. Cassie said, No, ma'am, it's not lies. It's all true. He raped me from when I was very young until I was 16. She looked over at her stepfather and said, Didn't you? He nodded. He was still crying. Her mother became hysterical. She ran out of the house and into the garden. Cassie ran out to calm her, but her mother grabbed hold of her as she did when Cassie was a child. She glared at her and said, I can't believe you slept with my husband. She slapped Cassie across the face. She said, You're a dirty, dirty whore. You hear me? A dirty little whore. I never want to see you again. You disgust me. Cassie was in shock. It was a devastating accusation to make against someone who was subjected to sexual abuse against their will. Cassie said, But Mammy, I was just a little girl, your little girl, and he did all those things to me. Her mother wasn't sold on this. She said, You're no child to me. As far as I'm concerned, you are dead to me. As her mother, stepfather, and Sheila left, Cassie sat on the ground and cried. She thought to herself, How could my mother say that? How could she reject me like that? How could she hate me so much? What did I do to make her hate me? Her mother never liked her, but now she had rejected her in toto. It was a tragic end to a relationship that had never been anything other than toxic. When Damien got home, he could tell Cassie was upset. When she told him what happened, he just said, That's terrible. Eventually, he would use what she told him against her. He would say something to the effect of, Your own mother didn't even want you. She was right. You are a dirty little whore. It was the worst possible thing he could have said, and he didn't hesitate. December 1997. Cassie was pregnant again. She found out she was having a girl, and she was ecstatic. She didn't get to see Stephanie much, and Stephanie had become distant toward her. Her new daughter, Lizzie, was born in August 1998. Damien didn't want to be there, but she forced him to. He kept asking how long the delivery would take because he needed to go back to the office to send a fax. He left a half hour after the baby was born. Damien didn't help with the kids at all. He would still abuse Cassie, and she reported him to the police several times more, though she would always take him back. She was still convinced they could work it out. She felt it would be good for the children to grow up with both parents in the house. She even convinced herself that it wasn't his fault, that she likely drove him to it. She decided it would be for the best if she had no more children. She underwent a sterilization procedure. Christmas, 1998. Cassie was in the process of preparing the children for Christmas when she found a hotel bill that had been torn up. She hadn't stayed in any hotels around that time, 
so it could only mean one thing. Damien had been seeing other women again. She presented the bill to him while he was watching TV. After riffling through implausible excuses, he finally admitted that he took a prostitute to the hotel. He took Cassie out for dinner, but it didn't make her feel better to sit across from him. He tried talking to her once they were home, but she was in no mood to hear about how she drove him to having sex with a hooker because Cassie was inadequate. She wouldn't allow him to touch her and generally avoided him. He would cap the conversation off by blaming her for everything. Sadly, she began to wonder if he was right. Her mother and everybody else in her life had scapegoated her for everything that had gone wrong and for all their poor decision-making. She had been a scapegoat and a punching bag all her life. She wondered if maybe she was wrong if the consensus insisted that was so. There is power in numbers, and she had always been rendered powerless. Damien continued to make her life a living hell. Whether it was asking for money to feed the children or taking a walk, he made everything a travail for her. One day a friend of Damien's confessed to her that Damien had been paying him to follow Cassie around. It was chilling to hear. Damien even went to the extent of bugging their house with surveillance equipment so that he could record her conversations. Sure enough, one night after she had had some girlfriends over, he approached her with a cassette in his hand. He started shouting about how she and her friends were dirty whores. He said he heard their entire conversation and declared that Cassie was nothing but a gutter whore. He told her no one would want her or love her. He told her she was nothing. He said she was making a fool out of him and that he only stayed with her out of pity. She was deeply hurt. She felt degraded and useless. She wondered if he was right. He was the one who brought a streetwalker to a hotel room, but he felt Cassie was the whore. He stormed out of the house. Cassie looked at some photos of her children and she broke down into tears. She was deeply depressed and felt trapped. It was a lonely existence. Only her children kept her going. Later, Damien shook Cassie awake and called her a dirty whore repeatedly. He informed her she was going to give him what she had been giving to the other men he told himself she was fucking. She begged him not to rape her, but he proceeded as expected. Cassie wondered if there was any way out of that life. Sometimes women who have undergone sterilization get pregnant. This happened to Cassie in early 2000. She was not at all happy about this. Damien took her to a hospital to arrange for an ultrasound. Once Cassie saw the image of the baby, she became emotionally attached. Damien didn't. He wanted her to have an abortion. It was an uncomfortable pregnancy. Along with the usual symptoms of pregnancy, like morning sickness, Damien was still abusive. Her new daughter, Hope, was born two months premature. Damien refused to go to the hospital. It made the experience hard for Cassie as she felt very much alone as her daughter was placed in an incubator and her survival was not guaranteed. When she brought Hope home, the other children were excited to see her. Damien was not. He wouldn't even hold her. He said her name was stupid and walked out. Cassie noticed that Hope shook and twitched regularly. It caused her to cry incessantly. It infuriated Damien, and he would run raging into the kitchen, telling Cassie to shut the baby up so he could sleep. Hope was diagnosed with right hemiplegia and epilepsy. Hemiplegia is a paralysis of the lower face, arm, and leg muscles. Essentially, she had a variant of cerebral palsy. It's a permanent congenital condition, and it devastated Cassie to hear that Hope would be forced to live with it for the rest of her life. This wasn't the only child to be diagnosed with a troublesome condition. Aaron had been poorly behaved. 
After being evaluated by a child development unit, it was concluded that he was autistic. He was on the more functional end of the autism spectrum with Asperger's syndrome. Now her job as a parent would be even more demanding and challenging, and there was no sign that Damien would ever offer anything other than financial support. He also left it to her to do all the cooking and cleaning and to work in the office. When she told him about the diagnosis, he jumped up and raged at her, saying there was nothing wrong with the children. He accused her of being just a, quote, attention-seeking bitch. He told her she brought it all on herself. Cassie was a magnet for people who have a distorted sense of personal accountability. One day had been particularly stressful. The baby wouldn't stop screaming. Aaron knocked Lizzie out of her high chair, and she got a bump on her head. She cried incessantly. Aaron threw a tantrum because he wasn't getting his way. Joss became upset by it all, saying, Why can't I have a normal family? Cassie's nerves were frazzled when a busybody she knew from the pub knocked on the door. The woman wanted to see the new baby. Cassie could smell booze on the woman's breath, but she invited her in. Damien arrived minutes later, and he chatted with their guest. They flirted right in front of Cassie's face. She was too tired to care. She had just fed Hope and was changing her diaper. The current bag of diapers was empty, so she asked Damien to watch her as she went upstairs to fetch more. Hope's buttocks were sore, hardly an anomaly as far as infant care is concerned. Cassie had been applying cream to the spot. When Cassie came back downstairs, Damien and the woman were talking trash about her. When Damien noticed the sore spot, he shouted at Cassie in front of the drunk woman, telling her she was negligent. The woman took a look at the sore spot, and she started shouting at Cassie, too. This was too much for Cassie to process. She threw the package of diapers over the banisters and climbed out of the window. She ran down the street and settled on a park bench. She was overloaded with stress and needed a break. She knew her children needed her, but she could not bear to hear more verbal abuse from Damien and the woman he was probably going to screw. She slept in the park that night. When she returned home in the morning, Damien verbally abused her, accused her of having sex with another man. At one point, Cassie decided she could not carry on with Damien anymore. She told him she was leaving him for good. She just could not tolerate the abuse another second. He begged and pleaded for her to reconsider. He promised to renew their vows with a proper wedding. He promised to reform his behavior. No more verbal abuse. No more physical abuse. No more rape. No more infidelity. Against her better judgment, she believed they could make it work. She took him back. Hope was christened the same day Cassie and Damien renewed their vows. He drank heavily at the reception, but Cassie put it down to his celebration of the occasion. However, he began to disappear intermittently. That could only mean one thing. Damien's temperament took a dark turn. At one point, Cassie was talking to some friends, including one friend's boyfriend, when she felt a painful sensation in her head. It was Damien grabbing her by her hair. He dragged her and threw her to the floor. He stomped on her face. He kicked her in the back and insulted her. The guests pulled him off her. She was left on the floor bleeding and shaking. When she looked up and saw the hatred in his eyes, whatever love for him that had been left over had dissipated. She was humiliated as her friends fussed over her. A large part of her died inside that day. She felt trapped, desperate, and alone. She had nowhere else to go with her children. Her mother hated her. Her relationships with her sisters were too damaged to be mended. She had no other relatives she could turn to. She was stuck in the situation. Damien was keenly aware of this, and he was delighted. One day Cassie was in an especially dark mood. 
She still blamed herself for everything bad that had happened to her. She also felt that any hardships experienced by the children were her fault somehow. She felt profound remorse for it and decided they would be better off if she were no longer their mother. She sat down and wrote them each a letter. She told them she loved them and that she was sorry for letting them down. It seemed to her that things could never get better. She folded up the letters and placed them on the island in the kitchen. She decided to end what had been a life that was bookended by abuse. She walked over to a cupboard and swallowed a large gross of tablets. Cassie woke up in hospital. She was disappointed and disgusted to find herself still alive. She asked a nurse how she got to the hospital. The nurse said her husband found her lying unconscious on the kitchen floor. He called the ambulance and somehow made her vomit before the medics arrived. She said that he saved her life. Cassie began to cry. She said, But don't you see? I wanted to die. I don't want to be here. I have had enough. The nurse said she would arrange for someone to talk with her. A doctor recommended that she stay in the hospital for a while. She spent three weeks in recovery. She was diagnosed with chronic exhaustion. She felt ashamed of what she had done. She was stunned by the selfishness of it. She couldn't believe there was actually an occasion when she decided to abandon her children. When she returned home, she suggested to Damien that they move to the country. She felt that the more sedate pace of life offered by a rural setting would be healing for them as a family. To her surprise, he agreed. Cassie and the kids loved their new house. Everyone was happier and healthier. Her marriage to Damien improved marginally, and though she was still falling out of love with him, it had at least improved. Even Hope's health improved, and her ability to walk improved a great deal, even if she was slightly behind her peers in that regard. Cassie wrote a poem about her children. Busy bees, five little people as busy as bees, five little people all wanting me, all trying to be what they want to be. My five precious gifts, one and all, all fighting to be heard, all standing tall. Little sweet darlings, I love you each and every one. I am so proud of you all and all you have done. My five little people as busy as bees bring so much joy and happiness to me. So I thank you, my darling little busy bees, and make this promise to you. Wherever life takes you and whatever you do, I will be here waiting, loving you. Cassie was delighted one day to receive a surprise phone call from Stephanie. Stephanie was about to turn 18, and she asked if she could visit Cassie for her birthday. She also asked her if she would consider letting her live with her permanently. It all came together smoothly, and Cassie was overjoyed to look around the dinner table and see all her children congregated in front of her. She had dreamed of such a visage for years. Stephanie and Cassie spent a weekend in London. Damien spent the weekend looking after the children. On the day that Cassie was due to return home, Damien called her and screamed a volley of nasty insults. He accused her of having an affair. She told him the accusation was ridiculous, but he wouldn't accept this. She acknowledged having platonic friendships with men, but she insisted there was no sexual intimacy. On the way home, Cassie received a call from a vicar. He informed her Damien had called him to say he was leaving the family and placed the children with a lady who lived in the village. When she went to the woman's home, she was greeted with looks of disapproval as Damien made sure to characterize Cassie in their minds as an unfit parent. The children were deeply upset. Damien told them he was going out to get them ice cream and never returned. 
Cassie returned home with the children and found that Damien had indeed cleared out his personal belongings. She tried to call him, but he would not answer. He left her with bills, debts, and no money for the children. It was hard, but she managed to get back on her feet. It was a hard situation, but she soon realized that for the first time in her life, she would have control over her life. It was time to take ownership of it. She wrote a poem about herself called The Baby. It went as follows. A baby is born, so the picture says. It's a picture of me inside my head. This baby was tortured, hurt, and abused. Neglected, battered, beaten, and used. As I close my eyes, I see myself cry. This baby forgotten. This baby is I. I focus a bit harder, and what do I see? A door in the corner, and that's just for me, with a bright shiny sign saying, Set yourself free. The baby goes silent, a smile on her face. As she crawls through the door, she's in a safe place. She cried, but the tears were followed with a sense of inner peace. She also felt exhausted, though calm. The next day, she told Stephanie she wanted to go to Ireland. She wanted to confront her past. They made plans to visit her homeland in February 2006. She kept a journal at this time. This is an entry she wrote a day before her departure to Ireland. February 23, 2006. It is 24 hours until I board the plane that will take me on a journey back to my childhood. A childhood that was filled with fear, tears, abuse, and pain. All these emotions I have carried around with me for 40 years. The purpose of this journey is to face all the pain as a grown woman and to set the little girl inside me free. She felt both empowered and scared. She reviewed her childhood asking herself what the worst aspect of it was. It was the fear that always stuck with her. She was beset by fear, and it never deserted her, plaguing her into her adulthood. Once they were in Ireland, Cassie brought Stephanie to the social housing unit Cassie lived in with her family as a child. It was a row house and was scheduled for demolition along with the rest of the units. Cassie and Stephanie were walking down the street when Cassie noticed a woman standing outside of a shop holding a bunch of balloons as part of a promotion. Cassie asked the woman if she could have three balloons. The woman gave them to her. Cassie released a blue balloon, which she chose to symbolize her mother. She chose to forgive her for all she did to her and wished her peace. She released another blue balloon, this one representing her stepfather. This was a lot harder, but as the balloon drifted up toward the sky, she forgave him for stealing her innocence and childhood from her. The third balloon was hers. As she released the yellow balloon, she asked God and his angels to help her be stronger. She asked to be released from all the pain that remained with her after all those years. She also asked him to make her be the best human being possible. After shedding many tears, she felt free. When Cassie returned home to London, she felt happier than she had ever been. One day Damien called after not having done so for eight months. He told her he wanted to be part of the family again. Though indecisive at first, Cassie agreed to take him back under the proviso that he never abuse her again. He vowed that he wouldn't harm a hair on her head. She took him at his word. She was in a forgiving mood. However, he went back to his old ways, putting her down here and there. She did stand up for herself at this time, but that would only do so much. She wrote a poem called My Ring, inspired by this experience. I look at the ring on my left hand, twisted and mangled like my heart. The diamond on top used to sparkle and shine, just like the outside of me. 
Inside, I'm dented, just like my ring. But I used to sparkle, smile, and sing. My old ring and I have been through the ringer. I gaze at myself in the bathroom mirror. I cry, and I ask, what went wrong? I see my sparkle as completely gone. I, like my ring, was pretty and bright, perfectly formed, perfectly right. With a few rough edges like the diamond inset, I gaze in the mirror and I think, is it over yet? One night Damien was laying into Cassie after a night of drinking. He was running her down about her performance as a homemaker, even though she was looking after four children by herself, with two of them being special needs kids that required extra care. At one point, he called Stephanie and Josh downstairs. He informed them that he was going to kill Cassie. He grabbed a knife and held it to her throat. He said, I'm going to kill her. I'm going to kill her. Josh flew into a rage and pried the knife out of Damien's hand and placed it on a counter. Damien retrieved the knife and waved it threateningly at everyone. He told them that if they took one step closer, he would kill them all. Josh grabbed the telephone and called the police. Damien dropped the knife and left the house. The canine unit found Damien hiding in a field nearby. Cassie drove him back home from the police station the very next day. She felt she shouldn't deny the children the presence of their father, even if he was abusive and toxic. Cassie got into some heated exchanges with Stephanie about the boys Stephanie was dating. One day Stephanie left, and they never spoke again, despite Cassie's best efforts to reconnect. At one point, Cassie became sick from pleurisy after having become very ill due to withstanding stress non-stop over a lengthy period. Cassie decided to move back to Ireland. The kids were also amenable to the idea, and after living there for a time, everybody was happier. That is, except Damien. He was emotionally abusive as before. She became deeply depressed again. She allowed herself to put on weight so that he would not find her attractive and would want to leave. Christmas Eve, 2009. Damien regaled Josh and his friends with his tales of going on drug-fueled adventures in London. Eventually, Josh and his friends went upstairs and back downstairs a few times until Cassie realized they were doing drugs. In fact, Damien had been supplying drugs to them. At one point, Damien began to verbally abuse Cassie, and Josh took part as well. Damien was pleased by this, watching with a malevolent grin on his face. Josh picked up a chair and threw it at Cassie. She ran out of the house and got into her car. She couldn't go anywhere because a remote control opened the electric gates, and it was in Damien's possession. She managed to enjoy Christmas Day with the younger children. She had to talk with Josh a few days later about the chair-throwing incident. She told him she was his mother and deserved respect. He concurred and vowed he would never do such a thing again. She wanted to believe him, but on Christmas Eve she saw the same look in his eyes that she had seen in Damien's whenever he became abusive. New Year's Eve Cassie went to a friend's house where she met a man who was a writer and director of films. She told him about an idea she had for a screenplay, and he explained the formula for writing a good script. They stayed in touch and collaborated on the project. After 25 years of marriage, there was no sign that things would ever improve with Damien. One day Cassie discovered he had cancelled his life insurance. The money was to be bequeathed to the children. He told her he canceled because he didn't want to run the risk of leaving her anything. He would undermine her when it came to the children. If she nagged them to clean their rooms or attend to any other duty, he would shout at her to leave them alone. He even encouraged the children to talk back to her. She wrote a poem based on this called, My Family. 
My family, my one true love, my every breath, it's all so broken, like it's dying a death. This unit I fought so hard to keep strong is now so damaged, it's all gone wrong. Violence, abuse, it's all taken its toll. The children take on the abuser's role. Gone is the love, respect, and laughter, replaced with hatred, hurt, and anger. These beautiful babies that I bore, that I raised, I love and adore, are broken souls and so confused. They don't understand how I was used. They don't understand how I was abused. It became part of their everyday life. To see a mum scream as their dad beat his wife. My family is damaged. It's all so broken. Now only words of hate are spoken. Cassie became so depressed she became reclusive. She succumbed to adhedonia, which is an inability to glean enjoyment and pleasure from activities that would normally please the individual in question. Despite Damien's inability to find one redeeming characteristic in Cassie, whenever she proposed separating, he wouldn't hear of it. Eventually, he succeeded in turning the children against her. She felt alone, unloved, and her feelings of self-worth plummeted to zero. One day, Cassie called an organization that provided services for victims of domestic violence. After several counseling sessions, a therapist convinced Cassie that the abuse she had been suffering all her life was not her fault. It was something she badly needed to hear, since abusers are all convinced that they are never at fault for the cruelty they inflict on others. Cassie began to see the abuse more clearly. She wondered how she could have tolerated it for so long. She wondered how she could forgive them and tolerate their abuse for long. This experience inspired a poem called The Phoenix. Watch the phoenix as she rises out of the ashes. She flaps her wings and tries to fly. Her wings are broken. She starts to cry. She lifts her head, feels the sun beaming down. She flaps her wings and begins to groan. The pain is so bad... It's restricting her flight. She is desperate to fly from darkness to light. She takes a deep breath to control the pain. She flaps her wings and tries again. She is up, she is gliding, though her wings are sore. She is enjoying the freedom. She wants more. She flaps her wings with all her strength. She's nearly there, but her wings are bent. Up she soars, tears of joy down her face. Newfound freedom she will embrace. Her wings get stronger. She is full of glee. She is happy, not frightened. Now she is free. Cassie's recovery had begun. She felt stronger and was prepared to be independent. She knew she had to leave Damien permanently. The problem was, he would always find a way to remain there with the children. He had turned them against her so they would more than likely have chastised her for turfing him out. Cassie made the difficult but necessary decision to leave the family. She did it for her sanity. They didn't respect her anyway, with even the youngest children complicit in the abuse. She got together with Damien after securing a housing unit for herself and told him she was leaving him for good. She asked him to make the split as amicable as possible for the sake of the children. Damien was far from amicable. He called her profane names and told her she was not going to take the children. She told him they could share custody with the children, alternating between both houses. He didn't like that idea either. He was an absolutist. She spoke with Lizzie, Hope, and Aaron. Aaron said he would stay with Damien but visit Cassie. Lizzie and Hope chose to live with Cassie. Aaron was an adult and could make up his own mind. He chose to stay with Damien. Cassie was heartbroken, but accepted it nonetheless. The last days in Damien's house were awkward and painful. She was still keeping a journal at that time. One entry. Thursday. 
Been given the silent treatment all day, was skulking around trying to keep out of Damien's way. The atmosphere is so tense, it's breaking my heart. Why does he have to be so nasty? He has been hovering outside my bedroom door. I am so frightened. I went downstairs to get a drink, and he started taunting me for sex. He was very intimidating. When will it end? From another entry. Monday. Had a lot of running around to do today. Damien didn't come home last night, so at least I had peace. I tried to call him to ask him to take care of the children, because I had to go to Dublin to have a check on a lump I have on my breast. I am a little worried about the lump, but with everything that's going on, I haven't had any time to think about it. Damien sent me some vile messages. He refused to have the children and wouldn't give me the petrol money to go to the hospital in Dublin. I had to ask Bridie and Patrick to help me out. When I got to the hospital, I got the all clear. The lump I had was a cyst, thank God. At least that's something I don't have to deal with. One night Cassie's relations with Lizzie fell apart. Lizzie told her she would not be moving in with her. Another night, Lizzie was being recalcitrant with Cassie. Cassie told her off for being cheeky. Damien started yelling at Cassie, calling her a disaster, and how dare she tell his little princess off. He went on to mock and jeer at Cassie as Lizzie watched. Lizzie joined in, calling Cassie names as Damien looked on, gloating. She was projecting the same hate in Cassie's direction that Cassie had received from Damien. This was heartbreaking for Cassie. She tried to talk to Lizzie the next day, but she was still angry and said things to Cassie she had never said before. Following this, Damien said, See, not even your own kids want you. You have pushed everyone away and will end up a sad, lonely old woman. Now only hope was moving in with Cassie. As Cassie packed for the move, Damien followed her around, grabbing things out of her hands. Cassie felt freer and happier in her new home than she ever had with Damien. He kept sending threatening text messages because he was keeping tabs on her, monitoring her comings and goings. She would even see him driving past the home. She begged him to stop, but he wouldn't. He also disallowed her from seeing her other children. What was worse, they didn't want to see her or even speak to her because he was feeding them all sorts of propaganda about what a horrible person their mother supposedly was. When Damien and Cassie went to court over a custody dispute, Damien had Lizzie testify against Cassie. Cassie couldn't bear to witness it, so she stayed out of the courtroom. Being denied her other children was an extremely distressing state of affairs for Cassie, and sometimes it was too much for her to bear. She would collapse on the floor and weep for hours. There was no limit to Damien's capacity for vindictiveness. He continued to stalk and harass Cassie. It wasn't enough for him that he had won. Cassie received an offer to move to London from an old friend. To her surprise, Damien consented to letting Hope move out of the country. Before they left, Hope asked if she could spend Christmas with her father. Cassie asked Damien if he would cooperate and send Hope to London after the holidays. He said he would, and Hope spent the season with him. When he came to pick Hope up, Cassie reminded him of his promise. He flashed her an evil grin. It occurred to Cassie that she had likely made a huge mistake. She wrote a poem called The Last Call the Black Panther. The Black Panther bellows his last scary roar as he takes my baby away. I'm laid broken and crushed on the kitchen floor. Inside I am screaming, please let her go. Don't take my baby, I silently say. But he snarls and he grins as he takes her away. I love you, mummy, my baby says. The pain in my heart, it's hurting, it's sore, as the last sound I hear is the slam of the door. The silence is deafening as my heart breaks in two. Crushed, I still lay there. What do I do? Flashes of laughter, hugs, smiles, and tears. 
of my beautiful children I had for those years, but all has been taken away from me now by the panther, the abuser, the wife beater, the user. I pick myself up, I walk around the house, empty rooms, so still, so silent. I pick up a toy my babe left behind. The tears that I cry fall till I'm blind. I hug my babe's toy close to my chest. What do I do now? What's for the best? A small smile creeps across my face. As I turn and walk away from this place, I know one day my children will come. I know they will know the truth. So until that day comes, when they walk through my door, one consolation through this hurt and this pain, the panther will never get to hurt me again. After 45 years of both child abuse and domestic violence, Cassie was finally free, and the healing began. Her children were still angry at her because of Damien's manipulation. That was hard for her to live with, but her life improved in all other respects. Update. Cassie Moore regained contact with and access to all her children. She gradually rebuilt those relationships, and it was the answer to all her prayers. She also met a man named Connor, with whom she fell in love. He treated her with respect and kindness, appreciating her and loving her for who she was. Cassie is still in hiding from Damien, but if he ever comes sniffing around again, he'll have to contend with Connor. Cassie wrote this poem inspired by this time in her life. It's called Fly. Fly, little bird, fly, fly, fly. The abuse is over. You now are strong. So fly, little bird, fly, fly, fly. And on your journey, promise me, never look back. Look up with glee. So fly, little bird, fly, fly, fly. Now you are happy. Now you are free. Thank you for listening to Human Monsters. Bye for now.